This is Tom Tolles. You're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. And you're doing it without your head. Think about it. Oh, wait, you can't. You don't have a head. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man, I went too far again. All right, welcome to Without Your Head Horror Radio, the station of decapitation. I am Nasty Neal, along with... Annabelle Lecter. And that would make me terrible, Troy. We have Judith O'Day from the original zombie classic, Night of the Living Dead. I know you have a mar- you have a martini right now. Oh, yeah, I uh, no, it's mm. t- very safely inside me, so I'm doing just <laughs> right. Uh, I always, I always, uh, I do think it's probably the the best to uh, to get liquored up before you talk to us. <laughs> well, for years I didn't, but I figured at sixty. Seven or whatever I am, it's okay. No <laughs> speak of that. Uh, are you surprised that like there's so many different generations of fans that uh that in, that, that know you and enjoy uh, Night of the Living Dead? Because it's not like just one age group. I'm at, I'm blown away that there is such longevity with our film. Just thrills me. I don't always understand it. But you know what? I don't question a good thing. I'm very, very grateful. What would you say, like, uh, would be like the youngest fan you've ever run across that, uh, that knew the movie? Oh my gosh. In some of the conventions I've gone to, I have met generations of families. The youngest of which, <laughs> I think maybe were, were, in a little push cart, you know, the, the little push things uh-huh. that, that mamas use to push their oh. kids around. Yeah, a little and carriage. I, I'm, yeah, a little carriage. And I, I have oftentimes asked these little miniature humans what it is they like about Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> and I marvel how intelligent they are. So I, I've seen quite a few decades or quite a few families, uh, family members, mm-hmm. who are, are supportive of the film. It's really wonderful. You sure there were, like, kids in the carriage? Maybe they were just grown adults, or you were <laughs> into a different type <laughs> Midgets lifestyle. tucked away. Just yeah. like a carriage every now and then. <laughs> oh, my. Now, see, now you're, you're making me question, and I'll be more <laughs> sarcastic and cynical the next uh, <laughs> convention I go to. Oh. <laughs> No, they're they're wonderful families. I think I've really uh, met within uh, one family. I think I've I've had about three generations of supporters of the film, which just absolutely amazes me. Yeah, that's wonderful. Is this a true? Yes, it is. True story. Troy is my brother. He's nine years older, and our mom used to take us to the drive-in. And so he would be like a teenager, I'd be a little kid. I was like, I believe I was five or six first time I saw the movie. And uh, I'm not a killer or anything, it, it didn't affect me that way. And um, there was a scene where uh, the, the truck blows up and the zombies are eating everybody. And uh, I believe I was crying, and, and she told me, oh, it's just a barbecue. And then I was like, oh, okay. So, <laughs> well, I think that's pretty close to one of the lines in the movie when the sheriff says somebody was having a, a cookout here, something to that effect. But mm-hmm. at, when you realize back in 1968 or 70, 71, that kind of thing really wasn't seen very often. So it, it, sure, it could scare young ones who were watching. Mm-hmm. I'm amazed you turned out as sane as you are. <laughs> <laughs> People who know you me. You are sane, yeah. are you not? I was going to say people who know me. Uh, <laughs> That's questionable. You might not be so surprised. <laughs> uh, Annabelle, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, you're talking about kind of the, the backstory of this film and the time it was made. And it's really uh, striking to me the way it was cast. I mean, you've got a, a black actor playing this major role at the time, a very strong role. He He ends up striking you in the movie. There's a lot of things going on with with how the people uh, function together in the movie and how the characters are seen as um, these really multifaceted individuals. And for, for what it is, I mean, it's a, it is a zombie movie, but there's a lot going on in there. What did, you, what did you think about that at the time, and how do you feel about that now? What 
I thought about it at the time, Annabelle, was I really didn't think about it at the mm-hmm. time. I didn't make that correlation. Mm-hmm. I was very involved in the pure element of being in a feature film. Mm. It was extremely exciting for me to be involved in this medium. I've al- I had always wanted to go into film. Mm-hmm. And at that time, up to that time, I had been involved in musical theater on stage and um, radio and television variety shows commercial work, voiceover work, but to be in a a feature film was a a big deal for me. Yeah. That's as far as I went in my head. Mm -hmm. I got involved, of course, with each scene I was to do and what they wanted me to do. It, It wasn't until later on, and I'd say decades later on, that I really started to think more deeply about what this film was, what it did, and and where it was at uh, at this point in time, and that's 20, 30, 40 years later. Hmm. It it took me a while to really think about the impact and the, 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 the things that we covered whether it was the black issue, mm-hmm. which we really didn't talk about at all in the film. It was just a man against another man, and it mm-hmm. just happened white and black. That's, to me, one of the most exciting things that, uh, about our film, and one of the things that I think sustains it as much as it uh, has been sustained over the years. We didn't make an issue out of the black and white. It was just survival. It was yeah. human survival. Yeah. You think and I love that. You think that's what makes it part of the reason why it holds up? Because you didn't try to go out of your way to make that an issue? And if you did, maybe, you know, years later it would seem a little outdated. And here it's, you did make an issue and you could still, you know, draw your own conclusions from it? You know what, that's a a very good point, Neil. I think you're right. Because we didn't purposefully make an issue of it, it was what it was. And it, it, it touches more people over a greater spectrum of time. It's more human survival than it is, let's talk about race. Mm-hmm. in 1968, which, of course, <laughs> at that time was such a big issue. Yeah. This was one of the magic moments mm-hmm. in our film that I think helps sustain it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, and it all goes so naturally because I don't think any of the characters ever mentioned that during the movie. No, no, no one mentions you're a black man. Or, yeah. No, you're right. Now, at the time, was it a risk to make a film like that with with a, well, a black man taking this? Uh, he was he was the the hero of the movie. Mm. Absolutely. Um, a, the better person to answer that question deeply for you would be George George Romero. Uh, were we taking a risk? I don't think. Well, I certainly didn't think of it as a risk. I thought of it as being a very fortunate young actress to have been cast Mm -hmm. in a a feature film. What George was thinking at the time, I I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I do know that there was no question in either his, Carl Hartman's, Jack Russo's, or Russ Streiner's minds that... Dwayne Jones mm-hmm. gave the best audition. Yeah. That's what they were looking for. They were looking for someone they felt who could carry the role. Dwayne could carry it. The fact he was black, really, I don't think, was the, at all the important point in the selection. 
for which I, I'm very grateful because, I, I, again, I, I think it's made a difference in yeah. the longevity mm. of film. Absolutely. Did you know George Romero before the movie at all? Uh, I had met George a short while before, some years before. I auditioned for a film he was doing, and I didn't make the part, or they didn't make the cut. Uh, I I really hadn't worked with him to any depth until I got involved in the film. Uh, you know, working with him, uh, what were like your initial thoughts of him as, as a director? I loved working with George. I loved his creativity. I I loved the fact that he'd go on for days in order to get what it was he wanted. And that fit very well with the kind of person I am and was at the time. He, I loved watching how he put scenes together. And you know what? If, if I can make a correlation, and I've never said this before, but I think of Clint Eastwood and, and how, as an actor, how, how well he transitioned as a director. Now, I know George wasn't so much an actor, but I think he understood uh, an actor's mind. Mm -hmm. he, he, I don't think George ever felt threatened by an actor's thoughts or feelings. He drew upon them, he said what he wanted, and he gave you the freedom to give him what he wanted in the best way that you felt you could do. And it, I, I, I know that... Uh, making that correlation between him and uh, Clint Eastwood might be unusual, but uh, it was very easy working with George, even with his intensity. Mm -hmm. uh, it was great, absolutely great. Yeah, it sounds like a, a real pleasure for an, for an actor to, to work with this guy. Almost like sure, you're being spoiled, please. though, if you're fresh in your career and you work with him and it's so wonderful, then I wonder what it's like to move on from there. Oh, I'm sure you yeah, you have a, a lot of different approaches with <laughs> all, all kinds of uh, directors. Mm -hmm. But to have that freedom, when George said, this is what I'm going for in the scene. Mm -hmm. um, these are the major things I'd like you to achieve within the 30 seconds or minute, whatever we had in the scene. And then he lets you do it. Mm. Uh, that, that was exciting. Yeah. Very, very exciting. <laughs> and also, I have to laugh at this. But remember, this, this was not a high-budget film. We didn't mm. have a lot of film stock to waste. Oh. You know, we, we weren't shooting digitally. We were shooting film stock. So he'd tell you what he wanted. He'd hope that you would achieve it. <laughs> because you, you couldn't do 150 takes. Yeah. It just didn't happen. We were lucky if we ever got more than two takes. Wow. Uh, for, for a scene. Mm. That's amazing that what came out of that is so, you know, it's so brilliant for so many people. It's just such an excellent movie. And to know that you perform so well under pressure, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, it was, it was a magic combination of time, people, and talent. Mm -hmm. well, when did you, like, realize that the movie was, was a big deal? Was it, ri like, right away, or what did it take time? Oh, no, 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 no. It wasn't until decades later, Neil, that I I had any inkling that the film was as powerfully accepted and considered um, a growing classic. I didn't... Well, first of all, the reason for that is that I was out west. Everybody else was back east. They got very much involved in a lot of the horror conventions going on. They were much more aware of how uh, important the film was becoming to a great many 
people. I, out west, doing my life and my musicals and whatever it was I was doing out, out west, di- didn't have that connection. And it, it wasn't until I shared a convention or two with some of my old butts from the film that I realized, my gosh, people really care mm-hmm. about our film. It, it was amazing to me. I've been to many conventions, uh, you know, with a lot of the cast members, and I believe I owe, I owe Russ uh, several quarters for saying the line many times. Um, how many? How, how often have you heard they're coming to get your barber? <laughs> how many? How often do I hear they're coming to get you? Yeah. I was. I just answered that question for a convention I'm going to be attending in uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania. <laughs> And my answer to that was gazillion. <laughs> I, and you know what? I never, honestly, I never tire of hearing it. <laughs> and I, I know you may question my honesty there, but it's true. I really don't tire of hearing it. Yeah, I don't think Russell does either because he's getting a quarter every time you say it. <laughs> oh boy, that would be nice. I'd like to get a quarter. <laughs> but that doesn't really matter. Yeah, you know, you know, we've I've talked to Lon John Russo and uh, George Cassan, and you know, they love talking about the movie. But there's always uh, a little like uh, you know bitterness or something there because you know they you don't have the rights to the movie, and so many people have uh, taken it and, and done their own thing with it. Uh, what are your thoughts on that when you see, like, someone taking the movie and um, adding their own things to it or, or selling something with, with the movie on it and, you know, you're not getting any uh, anything out of it? These things happen. Uh, unfortunately, whoever didn't put the copyright on the film when it was re-released, it's a shame. But these things happen. I don't hold any grudges for it. I I don't want to try to take advantage of it now and make as much money as as I can make out of it. I to be honest with you, I that's not as important to me. Mm-hmm. What's what's really important is the amazing fact that the film still carries weight in the the viewing public. Mm-hmm. That's, that's pretty exciting to me. And not a lot of films, and there are gazillions of films made every year, not a lot of films can boast that kind of popularity over time. Mm-hmm. So I... I I don't hold any resentments for it. Mm-hmm. Um, I really don't, and I'm glad because it, uh, it's a much more freeing way to live. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It seems like you're just so grateful for the, for the kind of human connection it's made. You know, you talk about these really great experiences you have at conventions, and, and you just seem so, so pleased by that, that you just strike me as the kind of person that the financial stuff, yes, it would be nice, but this, these other things are so much more valuable than that. Very, very true, Annabelle. I, I think some of the, the greatest times I've had are saying, are, are talking to people about little moments in the film that meant something to them. And they'll say, well, what did it mean to you? And, and how were you feeling then? Mm-hmm. And it, I, I know it's, it's just a, a little horror film among many great films in this world, but I I get such a kick mm. out of talking seriously to people who care about mm. the film. That's why conventions are a, a really great high in my mm. life at this point. Mm-hmm. Do you have any uh, particular uh, memories, like uh, that, so either so like maybe something a fan gave you at a convention, or just some type of interaction with a fan that stands out? To oh, you? absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I can remember the last uh, 
one of the last conventions, uh, uh, was it Seattle? I received uh, a copy of a portrait that a fan had made of Barbara. And it, it, you know, it brought me to tears. It, it was so amazing that this individual took the time to, to bring into that portrait all that feeling and, uh, and what, what feelings evoked in him. I have it hanging up in my office. These are things that continually happen to me when I go to these conventions. Um, I don't go to a, a, as many as Russ and George and uh, Jack, a, a lot of the other people who are still alive, but the ones I go to really knock me out. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people here in the chat room asking about uh, what are your thoughts on about the Save the Evans City Cemetery Chapel movement? Oh, um, you know, Gary was our sound guy on the film, he's brother of Russ Shiner. I think what Gary is doing is incredible. The effort he has put forth to get the, the, the horror people around him in support to make sure that that beautiful little stone chapel doesn't fall to rock and ruin, I think that's an incredible thing. It's a tiny thing, but you know what? For Night of the Living Dead, it's a big thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm i very grateful for all the effort he has made. And um, I, I, I think I feel that way, if I can share with you a little story. In, in one of the re-releases of the film, I think it was um, the one... Um, with George Romero, oh gosh, it was a black and white, or a red and white cover, I loved it, but on it was a, a bunch of interviews that we did coming back after all those years. One of them was done in the cemetery. When I went back to that cemetery, I hadn't been back since we filmed in it. It was surreal. I, I thought if somebody wiggled the, the atmosphere just a little bit, I'd be back in 1967. <laughs> I, and we'd be doing this all over again. Mm -hmm. it, it was magic. It was surreal. So I, I say, God bless Gary and all the effort he is willing to make and the fact that so many people are supporting him is is really a gift to the movie. Yeah, at the last convention we were at, it was a there, there, there was a big movement there at it, and um, I guess uh, they're going forward with it, so that's good news. Mm. They sure are, and I think construction is underway. I'm not sure when everything will be completed, but they they have certainly um, they've raised uh, enough money to be able to sustain that chapel. And I, I, I think that's wonderful. Well, uh, what were your thoughts on the uh, Barbara in the 1990 remake? <laughs> um, you know what? They are two distinctly different films from different times. When I made the film, women, women behaved a bit differently. Although I think my portrayal of Barbara was really sort of honest from my heart. Every person, whether he's male or female, will react to some kind of devastation, whether, whether it's a zombie attack or whether it's something more realistic like a, 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 an airplane crash or a, something to that nature, we'll all behave differently. Mm. Barbara, in 1968, I felt behaved very honestly. Mm -hmm. she, she had to understand what this was. She went into herself 
you could say she was a catatonic fool and didn't do anything. But you know what? Sometimes we have to do that. But at the very end, she came to the surface again, and she fought like hell to save Helen Cooper. In the remake in the early 90s, women at at that time were really pushing the envelope as far as what they could do and how strong they were. So seeing Barbara in fatigues with an Uzi was far more appropriate in 1990 or 92 than it would have ever been in 1968. Mm -hmm. Consequently, in answer to your question, each one I consider a, a separate entity unto itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you uh, did you keep any of the props from the movie? Oh, for the longest time I did. Yeah. I had my fall. I had my dress and my uh, my uh, raincoat. But as I moved around in Southern California, those things sort of passed by the wayside. And again, because I was so far away from people who were still involved with the growing acclaim of the film, I didn't realize that hanging on to those things might be pretty important. Mm -hmm. So I lost them along the way. Have any of them, uh, like, uh, resurfaced? Maybe when you're at a convention, uh, you might find somebody who uh, you gave something to, you know, Pat in the past, and here they still have it, and then brought it and showed it to you? No, not so far, but uh-huh. it would be interesting if that ever happened. I'd love to see it. Yeah. Are, are you surprised that zombies are, like, so mainstream now? <laughs> uh, I I try to get my handle around it or my hands around it. I may not always understand it, but I, I will tell you an interesting little side story. Uh, about a year ago, when... Oh gosh, mother! What's the name of the the uh, TV series that the Walking, Walking Dead. Dead? Walking Dead. The Walking Dead. I I was told by a, a son of a friend of mine, "Haven't you been watching The Walking Dead? This is incredible! It's all about zombies." And I said, "Gosh, no! I hadn't seen it." I I started watching. He said, "Well, I I TV'd." about four or five of them. You certainly don't have to watch them if you don't want to. But I started watching, and I couldn't stop. I was amazed at what they have done uh, in in filmmaking now and in storytelling with the, the zombie scene. I was hooked. I, I watched at least five uh, five shows in a row. And uh, I, I just hope it never really happened. Let me put it that way. I sure hope it never really happened. Yeah. It's weird because on, on this show for years, uh, you know, I was a big fan of the comic book, and I kept saying on the show, this the comic would make a great uh, TV series because uh, it's almost the comic book is almost like reading uh, George Romero zombie movie in comic book format. And it, it's gone on for a long time. So when it finally uh, happened to come on the TV, I was really happy about that. Well, then you you really guessed it because yeah. it certainly has yeah. been a popular series. Uh, uh, Troy, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was just curious. Um... What, what was the crowd reaction like back in, in 68? I mean, were people supportive at the time, or were they more like, oh, yeah, this is okay, and just kind of moved along? I, I think we had uh, I think we had a variety of reactions, some of which were, how could you let your daughter perform in something that was so violent? <laughs> That, that was one reaction that my family got. Um, another reaction, of course, was, oh, isn't this fun? Let's go to the movies. Let's watch the zombies. And then as the movie progressed, when it appeared to be so real, 
poor kids were scared out of their pants. <laughs> uh, so they they really were frightened at something that they had never seen before on the screen. Mm. Uh, we did. We we had a variety of reactions today because movies are so violent, mm. so over the top with computer FX that. Uh, you wonder how anybody could really care. But back then, people did care. It, it touched their sense of terror and reality in a way that horror film had not touched them before. Uh, kind of along those lines here in the chat room, uh, Chai Town Matthew, he wants to know, um, how how did your social life, uh, how was it affected by the movie role, either positively or negatively? Ah, interesting question. Being in Night of the Living Dead has changed my life. I, I went on to continue in the musical field for a long time. I worked with a variety of directors. I also began my own company teaching people how to stand up and present themselves. When they found out in those various classes that I taught over the years in major corporations, when they found out that this is the Judy O'Day who was in Night of the Living Dead, the whole tenor of the class changed. Uh, I, I was amazed. I, I would watch it happen. And it, yes, it was very helpful because people cared about the film. It had affected their own lives. And to actually meet somebody who was so integrally involved in it was very special to many people. So indeed, being in that film has had a profound effect on my life. A wonderful effect. Uh, Annabelle, do you have a question? Yeah, um, you were just mentioning uh, some of the changes that have happened in your life since then. Um, so you ended up moving away more from mainstream uh, movie acting and more into theater sorts of things. What? Why did you make that decision? That Was that something you decided to do on your own because it just felt better for you or was it something that just kind of happened? Oh, absolutely not. I would have loved to to have continued. And yes, I have made uh, a few films since then. Uh, if you're aware of November Sun, October Moon, Serial Slayer, what else mm -hmm. have I done? Women's Studies. I, I've done some fun things for young, independent filmmakers. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I, I have one that should be coming out the beginning of next year. It's a Jason Cullum film. It's called um, Face Inside. Hmm. And, uh, and another one after that, it's called Ed Dean DDS. But so I, I fortunately was able to continue in the film industry, but it was very much confined to the horror genre. Mm -hmm. I think I would have loved to have stretched out into more mainstream films. But since that, that didn't happen to me, although I did do The Pirate with um, Ann Archer, Franco Nero, um, Eli Wally, um, I, I loved the involvement in performance that I was able to have over the years mm. in live theater whether it was a comedy or a tragedy or a musical, it was still creative. Uh, it was still theater. So I, I've been very fortunate to have done, uh, had my, my foot into a lot of areas of creativity. That's excellent. Uh, Jade here in the chat room, she wants to know, um, what's your role in the new Night of the Living Dead uh, film, Genesis? Well, you know what? We haven't signed a contract uh, 
yet. I know that Matt Cloud would like to see that happen, and I think I would like to see it happen, to be honest with you. One of the major concerns is that, is this really legal? Uh, are they able to go ahead and make a film that is so closely related to the original? And, you know, with all the legal analysis that Matt Cloud has done, it looks as if it's okay for him to go ahead. Now, I don't think that Ralph Streiner or, or Jack Russo or possibly George Romero would quite agree with that. But at the moment, Matt is going ahead with his film, feeling that he is legally able to do that. And I, I also know that Matt is going out of his way to offer a deal for the originators of the film so that they can share in whatever financial benefit there might be. Mm. And I, I don't know if that's going to happen, but you know what? I hope it does. I, I just hope it does so that more people can become familiar with our story and other stories that are out there that are really interesting. I think Matt Cloud has an interesting concept to his story, and I, I hope I can be a part of it. Uh, let's see. Let's try this again. we got a 304 area code. Who are you? Um, Hated FX. What was that? Uh, Hated FX from Make One, West Virginia. Just right. kind of listening in. Oh, you, do you have a question? Or you just, you just, um, uh, yeah, you, you, she just answered it, believe it or not. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a fair. Hi there, from Virginia. Yeah. I so remember... Virginia. Hi, Judith. Hi, West Virginia. I did... Children's Theater in West Virginia, I loved it. Uh, it's amazing. I, I'm uh, affiliated with a couple of organizations doing theater around here. It's, Great. Uh, I'm a big fan of yours. Oh, bless you for that. Uh, I do have one question about the um, the filming itself. How was um, uh, how was Ben to work with? How was Ben to work mm -hmm. with Dwayne Jones? Yes. It was it was wonderful. If I if if I can choose very important descriptive words to describe them for you to understand, um, they would be intellect, focus, and seriousness. Dwayne Jones took his role as Ben very seriously. It wasn't Shakespeare, it was a horror film, but you couldn't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. he, he took them both that seriously. He was a dedicated actor, and it, working with him was, was really exciting. He was far more serious. I, I sort of had an edge to me, a little sense of humor, and I was younger than he so, you know, we, we had different personalities, but once George said action, we pulled it together, and uh, we had a great time. I, I was very grateful for the opportunity to work with him. That's amazing. Thanks for calling in, man. The uh, Will Bozarth on the Facebook. He wants to know uh, how much how much of a pain was it to work with the wig? <laughs> it really wasn't a pain at all. I, I think we had more bobby pins in that thing than, than uh, they sell in Target. Uh, <laughs> there wasn't a problem, uh, <laughs> at least for me. In fact, once we started shooting, you really I forgot about those things. If, if I had to run fast or I, if I fell down either on purpose or by accident, whatever happened to the wig happened to the wig. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't worry about it. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I've, I've noticed that you and a few of our guests have like really excellent voices. Did you get mm -hmm. professional training as an actress? Or is it something you've just developed through your, through your craft over time? 
I, I think it's the second of those. It's mm-hmm. just something that has developed over time. And uh, it's, I, I appreciate your making that comment. That's very nice of you. Oh, absolutely. Definitely is good. Uh, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I sure want to thank you, all three of you, uh, for inviting me on. I so enjoy talking with you all, and I love being able to talk to the people who call in. Mm-hmm. Well, we really oh, yeah. appreciate you coming on. Yeah, it's been a great time. Thanks. Yeah, I believe I asked Thank about three you. or four years ago, and then uh, we finally got you on. <laughs> you got me. Here we are. Okay. Thank you, you so work, much. Work, yeah. <laughs> You're very kind. <laughs> Just uh, one last question, because I saw you mention this somewhere. I think it might have been on YouTube or something. Night of the Living Bread was apparently a... Just, Overall, when you see like zombies used, uh, you know, as, as parody, like, uh, what goes through your mind? You know what? That I think that's quite an honor uh-huh. when somebody is willing to parody something you've done. Mm. So, Night of the Living Bread, I thought was hysterical, and I really felt quite honored that they would consider us important enough to parody. I'm gonna I'm 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 gonna search that one out now. Night of the Living Bridge. <laughs>